Hello, my friends. Welcome to Origins. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of God's creation. And we do that by usually having guests who are creation scientists. And that's the case today. Dr. Jerry Bergman is with me. Dr. Bergman, how good to have you with us. Thank you. Dr. Bergman is one of our most credentialed guests, having two PhDs and a half a dozen master's degrees in various areas of science. His background included, in 1979, losing his position as a professor because, for no other reason than the fact that he did believe, or he doubted Darwin and believed in creation. And so this is uh, really uh, uh, something that happened in your life that uh, was not only career-altering, but uh, really has had quite a, a, an impact on your entire life, hasn't it? Yeah, very much so. And uh, one of the results of that is uh, a book that uh, the name of our show today, Persuaded by the Evidence, is uh, also the title of this book, Persuaded by the Evidence, same title that you and Doug Sharp have written together. And uh, tell us just a little bit about this book. Well, the book basically summarizes uh, accounts of why people became creationists. And one thing I focused on was the fact that so many people believe that creationists are, well, they're just, they're born that way, or they're raised that way, and that's why they're creationists. And we wanted to show that many people became creationists because of the scientific evidence. In fact, many people in the book, including myself, became creationists by the evidence, not because we were raised this way. And this is why I titled the book, Persuaded by the Evidence. Uh, it, it's very important because the other side is always saying that we are so blinded by our superstition and our religion that we are un unable and in incapable of objectively looking at science, and this certainly refutes that, doesn't it? Yes, it does, and that was one of the purposes of the book, because most people in the book have PhDs in science, and many are practicing scientists. The first thing I want to do is define the term evolution. Okay. It's used in many, many different contexts to mean many different things, and we've defined it the way the orthodox evolutionists define it, and that is from the goo to you by way of the zoo. <laughs> or in other words, as more evolutionists commonly define it, as from molecules to man. I, I heard a statement the other day on a program They said, uh, a bacteria is your ancestor. I thought that was an amazing right. statement. But uh, it's, it's all life has come from a common source. Right. All right. Well, um, now, you have a, a quote up here that from uh, Ernst Meyer, a zoologist at Harvard. I, I would love for you to talk to us about Ernst for a little bit. Okay, let me just read exactly what he said. And this was a strong motivation for writing the book. One of the most influential uh, evolutionary biologists of our time was Ernst Mayer, who was, a, of course, professor at Harvard. And he said that, quote, no educated person any longer questions the validity of evolution, which we now know to be a simple fact. And he's been claiming this, by the way, for over 40 years. In 1967, he said, evolution is accepted by every scientist, every scientist, he says. And for this reason, it is lo no longer necessary to enumerate painstakingly the proofs for evolution. Now, when I read this, I thought, gee, I know many PhD level scientists that do not accept evolution as we defined it. And in fact, I started to make a list of these scientists and I ended up with over 3,000. And this is my list here. You can see it's pretty extensive. Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at a page, and every name on this page has a PhD after it almost. I think there's maybe one there that's a DDS, whatever that means. But it's PhD after PhD. And, you know, it's interesting that you've assembled 3,000 names of creation scientists, uh, particularly in light of some of the other shows we've done that have talked about the tremendous persecution that sometimes scientists have to go through when it's discovered that they're a creationist. Yeah, that's a very good point. I would have had many more names, but I did not add names to this list unless they were public. So they were public with their doubts about Darwinism, as I call them, Darwin doubters. Or they had published books about Darwinism, and it was very clear from the book that they did not accept the Darwinian worldview, as I define it a few seconds ago. Or I got permission. And there are many, many, many I would have loved to add to the book, but Certainly. I couldn't it would, because... It would have been at their peril. Right. And in fact, I, when I came out with the first edition, I did have three people write me and say, better get my name off there. I don't have tenure yet. I had a, actually several professors from Ivy League schools yes. who said, please get my name off there. I don't have tenure yet. So when I get tenure, I'll come out of the closet, but not until then. So I took their names off right away. Well, a couple of things come to mind when you say that. First of all, I wonder how big a list we could make if we had God's knowledge, how many 
more PhDs there would be that were creation scientists if they hadn't been persecuted and if there hadn't been prejudice against them because of their faith. And that shouldn't be happening in this country. But no. secondly, there's a hopeful sign to that. I think there are more folks out there who are creationists than maybe uh, uh, Ernst Meyer would ever even suspect. Oh yeah, many, many more. And uh, there's, no one knows for sure, but we've done a number of studies. Uh, others have done other studies. So these studies together as a set indicate that there is possibly 100,000 scientists in this country that are creationists or support the creation worldview. In the world, the whole world, we estimate there's about a million individual scientists who are supportive of the creation worldview. Now, many of these are Muslims and other faiths. They're not all Christians. But nonetheless, when you look at the three so-called people of the book, Christians, Muslims, and uh, the Jews, there is an enormous number of people that simply don't buy into evolution. That's All right, true. enough about Ernst Meyer. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about his definition of, um, of evolution. Can we do that? Okay, let me, and the way I define it, some people say, no, 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 that's not right. So let's use Ernst Meyer's definition of evolution. By the way, he lived to be 99, and he wrote several books in his last decade of life, and he just died recently, so he's not listening to this program now. Okay, well, but, he can't tune in. Yeah. <laughs> then I fear for where he is rather than giving him social commentary. Yeah. All right, let's but move on. Anyways, he defined evolution. He calls this Darwinism, uh -huh. which is actually the term I often use. He calls this Darwinism, and this is his definition. Quote, all supernatural phenomena and causations. The theory of evolution by natural selection explains the adaptiveness and diversity of the world solely materialistically. It no longer requires God as creator or designer. So he's specifically saying that the existence of all life, in fact, the existence of everything is due to purely natural causes. There's no need to invoke God or any supernatural intelligence at all in anything in what we see around us, living and non-living. You know, this is an incredible definition because I grew up for 25 years, I was a pastor in the United Methodist Church, and I would say it's probably the majority of the pastors of the United Methodist Church. One of, the, one of the tunes that they love to sing is the compatibility between evolution and Christianity. But I think that the people who are really defining Darwinism or evolution, they must chuckle at those folks. I think they are... Uh, allies that they maybe have with them but don't hold in very high regard because they're saying that what evolution is about is that there is neither a need for God or a God, which is totally incompatible with a, for a Christ follower in my opinion. Right, that's true. In fact, when I was an atheist, we used to often call these, what they call theistic evolutionists, useful idiots. Is that right? That would be what they would call them. Call them. And that term was heard over and over and again, and they felt they're useful for now. Once we convince the world of the truth of Darwinism, as Ernst Mayer defines it, then there will be no need for religion, and they, in essence, are digging their own grave. So what is your goal in writing the book? Besides to show that there are many people who accepted creation because of the evidence, I also find exploration of the evidence helps solidify the position that indeed creation is supported by the scientific evidence. And some were theistic evolutionists who became creationists because of their study of the evidence. But one of my goals was so much scientific evidence out there in support of, of creationism. And this evidence was, well, it's hard to convey to the common people. And so I wanted to write a book that would be easy to understand by the common people. A readable human interest story of creationists who have accepted creation based on evidence. It's not that their faith said, well, this is what I have to believe about uh, evolution. It's that the evidence of science brought them to believe in creation. Right, and many stress very strongly that I would not be a Christian today if it was not for my study of evolution and my realization that evolution is not supportable by the science, and therefore they became creationists, and then they became Christians. Do you think it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian? Oh, clearly. And uh, in fact, there's a book written by uh, Norm Geisler, who uh, you know personally, and he wrote a book titled, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And he shows that, indeed, it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a creationist. It does, because you have to get something from nothing. That's right. right. Um, you were an atheist at one point. Let's talk yeah. about your own personal journey before we talk about these other guys. Well, the first thing I looked at when I was questioning my atheism, and I began to question atheism for a number of reasons. One reason was a lot of the scholarship that atheists did, I 
realized through a lot of reading was just not valid. Like the claims about Galileo and Bruno and the claims that the church executed many, many, many scientists because of their science. I realized that these claims were just not true. Just, they're just false. And so I became disillusioned with atheist scholarship. And the next step was, indeed, is there any evidence for evolution? Because a major reason why many people are atheists is because they are convinced we do not need a creator to account for the origin of life and the universe. And so this is a foundational uh, doctrine of atheism. And so I decided, well, if this is not true, indeed, if evolution is not valid, then that negates the main reason why many people are atheists. And so then that forced me to look into uh, creationism first and then Christianity uh, later. I was fascinated by the chapter in the book on your own personal walk to, to learn that you grew up with a mother who was a Jehovah's Witness right. and a father that was an atheist. So I saw both extremes. And you did, and yet uh, you essentially rejected both in favor of what you saw to, came to see as the truth. Uh, right, that's true. Okay, that's wonderful. Well, I think you're an incredible example because most of our folks think that we have to be a Christian so we hold on to creationism. And I think stories of folks like you, who it was the science of creation that eventually brought you to Christ is tremendous. Why don't you go up to the board and talk to us about uh, some of the others in the book as well. First, I should mention that uh, some of these people in the book were reared Christians. Yes. But they held on to their conclusions due to the evidence. Uh -huh. So the evidence was important, even in these cases. And my own conclusion is, I should mention, and, and the conclusion that I used in writing the book was, Evolution, which I define again as molecules to man, never happened, could never have happened, and this is based on science, not on religion. This is a very common misconception. People assume that people are creationists because of religion. And in my case, I found many, and most in the book actually, held on or became creationists because of science, not because of religion. And Example is, we can see this uh, progression here, which, by the way, I just recently wrote an article about, but this is commonly presented. And when you study this, you find that these are either faked or they are uh, distorted or the evidence is very unpersuasive for what they call a monkey or primate to uh, man. Of course, actually, they stress that man has a common ancestor with apes. Man did not descend from apes, but that's a minor point. And another concern, and this comes out in the book, is that dogmatic evolution, I find, is interfering with science. That's it's, fascinating. It's going to keep us from the advancements we need to make. Right, because you are looking at the world with very distorted glasses. Uh -huh. You're not looking at what's there, but you're looking at what you want to see there. So we're not dealing with reality. Right, right. And there are many examples of blinders. And I stress, you must look at the evidence only, and this is why, of course, we use the title that we did for the, for the book. And you must not force the facts into an evolutionary interpretation. And this all too often is done. And uh, I could give several examples, but probably one of the most familiar to me is pseudogenes and junk DNA. It was said for a long time, in fact, I remember discussions that I got into with colleagues. They said, Bergman, this DNA is junk, like 95% of the DNA is junk. It has no function. And I say, we can't say that. All we can say now is we don't know that it has a function. And they said, no, look, you cut it out. Introns are removed from the uh, gene and they're not used, they're not transcribed, they're not translated. Therefore, they are junk DNA. They have no function. And over and over, I argue with colleagues about this. Now it's widely recognized that much, if not most, possibly almost all of this so-called junk DNA now we know has a function. Much of it has a regulatory function. That's amazing to me. I think today uh, DNA is held in such regard that to think that it wasn't that many years ago it was regarded as junk is kind of scary. Yeah, yeah. It, and I've seen what creationists were arguing for many years has been to some degree, if not to a large degree, vindicated. And this says, many scientists, by the way, will admit that this has interfered with doing science. We should have recognized at the beginning that, well, we don't know what it does, but let's try to find out what it does and go from there. Well, some examples in the book. Dwayne Gish, his story of uh, his life, he went to University of California, Berkeley. And I, most people, I didn't really know much about his background until he did a chapter for the book. He was, um, for many years, was one of the 
most uh, well-known creation scientist. He's retired now, but he did his uh, work in uh, biochemistry at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. He also was a researcher for Cornell and industry for a number of years. Henry Morris, also well-known, and many of us, I didn't know much about his background, and he, uh, PhD from the University of Minnesota. He also was a chair and professor of hydraulic engineering at Virginia Polytech Institute and State University, often called just Virginia Tech. And I go into detail, or he goes into detail uh, in his life and why he accepted creation. He was at one time a physic evolutionist. He was not a creationist, a, a young earth creationist. Another case is Raymond Damadian, who uh, has a medical degree and was a professor of biophysics at the State University of New York. And he's well known for inventing the MRI. Wow. And there's been quite a bit written about him and how he developed the MRI. One thing he told me was that when I was developing the MRI, people said, you're crazy. You can't put people in magnets. It's not going to work. You can't do it. Then when he developed the MRI and it finally was proven to work, and of course now it's a standard technology in many hospitals, then his friend said, you didn't do it. So when he was trying to do it, they said you couldn't do it. When he did do it, they said you didn't do it. Which is, even though he has legal patent, he had to go to court to protect his patent. He did prevail in court, and he is the legal inventor of MRI. For the record, he did it. <laughs> he did it, yes, he did it. All right. Although others improved upon it. Sure. But that's common with most inventions. Oh, yes. And, uh, but he did the initial work which showed that MRI technology is possible. Isn't you can nice? image bodies using magnetic resonance imaging. And he was a creationist. And he was an uh, outspoken creationist. Great. And there's a chapter uh, about him in, in the book. Warner von Braun, who was actually the leader of our space program, he was a German scientist. He was captured by the Americans after World War II, uh, brought to America, and he worked on our space program. In fact, he's called the father of the American space program. So whenever I think of satellites and the space shuttle program and the whole space technology program, one thinks of Warner von Braun, who actually was the, the father of this program. He uh, got us uh, developed so that this program finally became uh, feasible. And here's a picture of Warner von Braun in his office. And uh, Everett C. Everett Koop, well-known uh, Surgeon General. In fact, he probably is the most famous Surgeon General in history. Wow. He also is a uh, creationist, and I have several letters that he wrote which talk about his beliefs about uh, creation. And uh, he has an autobiography which he wrote as well where he talks about his, the importance of his religious beliefs. He's more well known because of his opposition to abortion. That's right. But nonetheless, he is uh, involved in the accepting uh, creationism. And interestingly, Dartmouth Medical School, which is where Coop graduated from, they recently added a wing to Dartmouth, and it's called the Coop Complex, and here it is. It, it looks like you might be able to be a creation scientist and still be successful in your field, um, as I look at that complex that they built in his yeah. name. Uh, quite a man. He was very successful. It's uh, said that when he began doing work, he did mostly surgery on infants. Yes. When he began doing work, the success rate was like 10% for many surgeries. After he perfected the techniques, the success rate became the reverse. 90% success, 10% failure. Wow. So Dr. indeed- Dr. Bergman, I'm finding myself thinking about the young people watching our show and as they look to men like Coop and see that, you know, you can be, you can believe in our God and you can believe in creation and God can still use you in science to do incredible things. We have to take a break right now. Don't you go away. There's some other great people who have become great men of science because they saw the evidence that God was the maker of all things. You want to hear the story, so don't you go away. We'll be right back. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. Wonderful water, designed for life. We drink it, wash in it, cook with it, and swim in it. Every system in our body uses it. The earth could not support life without water. Water is 83% of our blood, flushes body wastes, lubricates joints, keeps our body temperature stable, and transports nutrients. Water is a part of cells which make up all living things. It is a very small molecule, but it's the biggest ingredient of our planet. Water has been designed just right by our Creator for life.
Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Jerry Bergman, is the author of several books, including Slaughter of the Dissidents, Killing the Careers of Darwin Doubters, and Persuaded by the Evidence. For book orders, go to Amazon.com. Dr. Bergman has presented over 100 scientific papers at professional conferences, has over 800 publications, and is a frequent guest on radio and television programs. Dr. Bergman is also a professor at Northwest State College in Ohio, where he teaches biology and chemistry courses. For more information about our guest, you can write to Dr. Jerry Bergman at Northwest State Community College. His email address is jbergman at northweststate.edu. We're back with Dr. Jerry Bergman and we're talking about his book, Persuaded by the Evidence, which is the real life account of creation scientists who, uh, as creation scientists, they were persuaded by the evidence of science to their faith in Christ. And there's a couple of famous ones left for us to talk about, isn't there, Dr. Bergman? Yeah, Mortimer Adler's one who I always respected. He was the uh, editor of the Encyclopedia Britannica. He was a professor at the University of Chicago and he also, which is one of his greatest accomplishments, he developed this series called the Great Books program, which a lot of people have heard of, and there's the Great Books. He took all the historical writings and selected from those 54 volumes of material of what he considered the greatest people in our history, Aristotle and Plato and, and uh, uh, various other people. And this set, as far as I know, still in print, most every large library has it. Sure. Uh, I have a set, I've had set for many, many years. It's, uh, in fact, there was a great books program where people would get together in groups and study the great books work, which he assembled. And uh, C.S. Lewis, it's uh, not too well known that he was a very uh, active creationist oppo opposed to uh, evolution, although he didn't write a lot about it directly. You kind of have to read between the lines to understand what he had to say. He wrote a lot against naturalism, which of course is a central tenet of Darwinism. And later on in his life, he did write a book called The Great Myth. And, a, and in that a small book, actually, in that he really effectively dissected why evolution could not be true. But ironically, that wasn't published until after he died. He was kind of fearful of being too open about his opposition to Darwinism because he felt that uh, it would detract from his main message, which was a Christian apologetist. Right. But he clearly did have major reservations for it. That, in fact, it was an entirely different worldview. Right. Uh, and, uh, and so it had to be addressed. I, I uh, would urge our people to read. You call it the great myth. Yeah. Truly one of the great minds of uh, the 20th century, uh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, clearly. And there's a cover magazine a story about him, C.S. Lewis, on Christian History magazine. And he's probably most famous for his uh, work, which has been translated into movies and many languages. Dr. Bergman, as you were uh, talking and writing with the men whose, uh, and women whose uh, stories are told in this book, do you ever come to a point where you think the truth is going to become so overwhelming that the lie simply won't hold water anymore? Uh, it seems that way if you're willing to look at the, the yeah. reality, if you're willing to study and read what people have said and what we found through science about reality and the truth will prevail. Yes, it will, eventually. And uh, we're thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ that are told about in this book, who the evidence of science brought them to a conviction that there had to be a creator, and then as they explore that creator, they come to know that it's the God of the Bible. Dr. Bergen, what a great work you've done for us. What a great gift this book and your life are to the church. And above all that, remember this, my friend, it's still God's view that he created you. And that should be your worldview too. Hope you'll join us again here soon for Origins. Until then, God bless you, my friend. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 913 from our website 
at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 913, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family. 